delay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'd like to introduce the moderator for this particular forum, Captain Cole Napper. Please give it up for Captain Cole Napper. Thank you very much. All right. Wow. Great to see so many awesome faces out here uh, this afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, ADM, Boca Jasmine Johnson, and Noah Johnson, I am incredibly excited and honored to welcome you to, on this lovely afternoon to an opportunity to meet the 2022 candidates for the athens Clark County Mayor's Race. Welcome to our candidates from other races who are here. Uh, Alan Jones from District 7, uh, and a representative, if you'd like to wave. Uh, are there any other candidates for other offices that are here? Okay, sir, what's your name? Let us know. Sorry, I, I was told that we were a candidate. I'm Jared Bailey. I used to be the commissioner of District 5. I'm running here District 5. Yes, sir. So, Jared Bailey, District 5. Okay, thank you, sir. Any other candidates from other races, school board, here? Okay, great. Excuse Who? me, I want an hour. I'm sorry? Oh. Paul, Paul Walton, current mayor of Hull in Mexico County, Georgia, running for 10th Congressional District. Outstanding. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Appreciate that. Okay. Is that it? Oh, yes. D.A. Gonzalez. <laughs> Thanks. I'm not a politician. I didn't realize that y'all were even here. Thank you for being here, commissioners. Thank you, thank you. Okay, anybody else? I don't want to forget anybody else. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as said, my name is Chaplain Cole Knapper, and although I was born and raised here in Athens, I've only been living back here for less than two years. I am super proud of my hometown, and I hope that my hometown of Athens, Georgia, is proud of me too. Because the two things that I always like to talk about are the things that I'm most proud of, my education and my military service. You see, I, I hold three master's degrees in education, technology, and media, including two from the Ivy League, and an undergraduate degree from the historically black Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. In addition, I proudly served for over a decade as an active duty Army officer and non-commissioned officer, deploying on four separate tours of duty to the Middle East, and support of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I've had the very best that America has to offer, both the stellar ed education and the opportunity to serve my country during wartime. And it is only because I know who I am that I was born right here in this beautiful city, the city that nurtured me and made sure that I had the very best education that this country can offer because I know that Athens is a magical place, it's a special place, and I believe it is a transformational place. And if we are to move forward as a country, as a city, as a state, I believe that we must unite in ways that our forefathers never dreamt of. I believe that this requires waking up. We have allowed some people to tell us that the things that we know that are good for us are somehow bad for us. See, we have some folks who believe that it's okay to be asleep at the wheel. They have convinced us that being woke is a bad thing. Well, I'm here today to tell you, Athens, Georgia, it's time for us to get woke. It's time to wake up to the hatred that is out there. It's time to wake up to the violence that is being waged on our country and our schools and in our neighborhoods. Wake up to the suffering of others. Finally, we need to wake up to the life and death urgency of global warming and climate change. And it's all directly connected, but you can't see it if you're asleep. See, our planet is on fire, but many of us are asleep. And I'm here today to say that we got to wake up and help each other put out this fire that we have caused with our stubborn dependence on fossil fuels. But you need to know that once you're woke, Athens, Georgia, you won't be able to get back to sleep. And that's not a bad thing. 
Because there are people in the state who want you to stay asleep while the house is on fire. As you leave here today, I hope that your hearts and minds are awakened by the words of these transformational candidates that we have on the stage today. AADM is here to make sure that you don't go back to sleep after you leave here today. Help us by making sure that every commissioner, every school board member, every police officer, sheriff, parole officer, every principal, every University of Georgia student and professor, every school teacher, every, well, our governor, and all of the Board of Regents knows that being woke is a good thing. Don't let people take that back and try and politicize it because it is only by being woke that we are going to be able to get better. So I want you all to feel the power that is in this room today. I want you to look around because this is our strength. It is a multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, intergenerational group of people in the city, and I know that we can change if we want to, but we got to wake up first. So when I say get woke, I want you to call in response and say stay woke. Get woke. Stay woke. Get woke. Stay woke. Get woke. Stay woke. 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 Doggone right. All right. Now let's go Athens. Now that y'all are awake and pumped up, we are here today to appreciate our First Amendment rights to free assembly and free speech. Uh, again, on behalf of AADM, we are excited to have four of the six mayoral candidates here with us today. We have Kelly Gertz. Pearl Hall, Mykeisha Ross, and Benny Coleman. Ms. Mara Zaniga was wanted to participate but had a scheduling conflict, and we were unable to confirm Mr. Fred Mormon. So without further de delay, let's get started with some questions. First, each of our four candidates will have up to two minutes to give an introduction and to tell you a little bit about themselves and why they're running for mayor of the Classic City. We will have four rounds of prepared questions, then at round two, we'll open it up to questions from the audience and ones that have been submitted on the AADM website. So, and we will rotate the order that we go with these questions. So, first up, Mr. Kelly Gertz, please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for a term as mayor of this great city. Uh, thank you, Chaplain. Um, and I. Uh, Appreciate everybody being here and particularly want to appreciate the other candidates here. Um, it's, thanks for that. I've got the green light. Is it working? All right. All right. Well, thank you to AADM. Thank you, Chaplain Cole. Um, and, and thanks especially to all the candidates who are running here in the Classic City. Um, People don't give of themselves easily for any reason. Uh, you give of yourself as a candidate because you love the community you live in. And so I want to offer affirmation to everybody who's here on stage. And I know I'm going to learn from the experience of this campaign, as I have from past campaigns. And I hope we all do, because I think as was stated in the introduction, that's the nature of democracy, that we should always be learning and growing. Uh, it, it's a benefit of being alive and being on this planet. Uh, we, Athens, really have been forged in the fire the last few years. You know, we've had challenges that I don't think any of us ever woke up or went to bed imagining that we would have to face. Um, and of course, we know that for some Athenians, you know, they've lived life, lifetimes full of challenge. And what I'm grateful to be here for is the opportunity to meet those challenges, to offer foundational supports to Athenians, because that, I think, is what we're called to do, to figure out how can we, in a way that's going to create generational impact, make sure that our young people are well-resourced in every neighborhood and in every community, from access to public spaces, to opportunities for fresh food, to the opportunity to move into productive and healthy lives and great jobs. And we, of course, need to make sure that we're thinking of lifelong needs for all Athenians. We need to make sure that we're working with our partners across the state and across the nation to bring better health care resources to all. And particularly, as we found so challenging in these last couple of years, mental health resources and behavioral health resources to all. 
And we need to take care of the core infrastructure that maintains our ability to have a community that not just in five years, but in 50 years is going to continue to be a magnetic and an attractive place. And as a government, as an organization, we need to be doing all we can to reach out to every corner and every community within athens Clark County. Because every individual is important, every young person, every person of every color, every person of every nationality, no matter who you love or how you express yourself, we want you to be welcome here in the Classic City. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Ms. Hall? Good afternoon. As Cole say, my name is Pearl Hall. I am a true resident of Athens, Georgia. I love athens Clark County. I was raised, I was educated, and came back and truly love the city that I love. And you ask the question, Pearl, why do you want to run for mayor? Many reasons. Number one, I got my heart broken late on a Saturday afternoon. Oh, how I loved UGA. And I love to watch the cheerleaders on for a Saturday. I go down Hancock, because I was born in, on Hancock. And it's always been like home to me, and will be. And as I journeyed down Hancock, riding in my car, I saw to my right the red and black, the pom-poms, cheering, and how happy my heart was. I cheered, I cheered, and I cheered. But as I drove on down, I noticed on my right that was a mother with five children, one in her arm, one little seven-year-old pulling wagon with clothes, and she's struggling with the baby. That dropped my heart to pieces. I kept on going. I wanted to stop. I wanted to help them, but I knew I couldn't. If I had picked that mother up with her children, had an accident, then the good I would have tried to do would have gone solid bad because they didn't have a car seat. And as I continued on, I began to cry. I cried and I cried. I cried for that little seven-year-old because as she looked over to the side and stopped, her mother dragged her and pulled her. But all she wanted to do was look at those cheerleaders just like I did. And now if I looked and she cried more and she began to cry more, and I began to cry more. And I said, Lord, what can I do? I look, I usually have a bump on. I didn't have one, but I was afraid if I had one, what would the mother say? She may have said that I couldn't give it to her. So. Okay. Thank you. So uh, just so you all know, we have a time timekeeper right out here with uh, red and uh, red, yellow, and green cards uh, to help with our timekeeping. So. Uh, if you all could keep your eyes on Mr. Paul Valkenberg, that would be great. Thank you, ma'am. Next, Ms. Mykeisha Ross. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank y'all for having me here. Uh, the question is why I ran for mayor. A little bit of what I do every day is I wake up with two children, um, my son, Kimon, and my daughter, Kamari, who I'm currently looking for to audience, but it's not here. Um, <laughs> but um, every day I have a duty, a responsibility to respond to the community feedback that I'm receiving as community outreach um, within my organization, Youth is Life. And a lot of what I do is partner with stakeholders and individuals in the community to form collaboration partnership and unity. What's important to me is unity. I don't see it here in Athens. So how can I address it? I can start continuing to start those meetings, continue to gather those individuals who need to sit at the table with each other to discuss a better thing for our community. So my everyday work, not what I'm promising, but what my actions are every single day is to address homelessness, Clark County School District and the limited resources that we have for our youth. That's why I build the youth organizations to help them build their own brand and to identify themselves. Because it starts with our youth. What are they going to inherit to get their level of nothing? And right now they have nothing. They're in fear. 
So I represent not just me, but a generation of lost souls who's been crying out for this city. So I'm here to stand up and fight for it boldly. Um, but a lot of what I do each and every day is secure the, the food for the homeless. I have an organization that addresses those issues. I don't just drive by the homeless, I go out to the homeless. I meet them where they are. A lot of what Athens is lacking is the meeting them where they are. And that's who I am. I meet you where you are and I address. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, and Mr. Coleman. It's a deep pleasure to be here. Can't you? They can't hear you. Can you use yeah. It's a deep pleasure to be here. I'm here to represent the little people. My name is Benny Coleman. I've been married for 40 years. Have three kids and two grandkids. We all have different ways of expressing ourselves in Clark County. Thank you, sir. We all have different dreams, different ways to live our lives. Athens Clark County is a melting pot, as we all know. We come from different races, different backgrounds, nationalities, and wealth. The little people here in Clark County need help. We need someone to stand for them. And we need to acknowledge the ones that are fortunate than we are. The one who has the opportunity to do better than others. The little people here in Clark County feel like they are nobody. They are nobody. As you can notice, people sitting around in the library, bus stops, tents. They are sad. We are sad. My choice here in Clark County is to represent everybody, as many people as I can to bring unity among all people. God is my master, as you know. So I owe nothing to no one here. So I come here to give my love to everybody here in Clark County to run for mayor, to have an open heart, an open door, an open policy, to hear each and every person's idea and to accept what they may have among us. I know I am green, never ran for any office here at Clark County before. I never stood before or sit before as many people as you are today. But I'm willing to serve the people because that's my life. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Thank you all of our candidates for those wonderful introductions. Now we're going to move into our first question. Our first question of the day is... And the order for these questions is going to be Ms. Pearl Hall, Mr. Gertz, Ms. Ross, and Mr. Coleman for this first question. So, starting with you, Ms. Hall, what do you see as your primary role as the mayor of athens Clark County? What do I see as my primary role as mayor for Clark County? My primary role is try to bring our city together in unity. I want everyone to care for everyone, regardless of where you live or what status you are. I know that's hard to say. I understand that. Because I got calls from people that live in Five Point, a place that I really never, ever had the opportunity to visit other than to go to the store and to the to the bank in that area because I had no other reason over there. And I always wonder what it was like to really know someone, which I do, but to socialize in that area. So, and I'm sure there may be someone in here who never been into the Rock Spring or Broad Acres area, but we want to know what it's really like in that area. And that's what I would like for us to do. Join together in unity, and see what it's like for someone who is less fortunate than you are or who you may think is less fortunate than you are, and exactly not. So that's my purpose, and that's really my heart. Thank you very much, Ms. Hall. Mr. Gertz. So while 
there are certainly some formal tasks of the mayor that are outlined in the Charter of the Unified Government. What I'd identify broadly is that the role of the mayor is to be something of a funnel and to reach out and take in all of the needs of the athens Clark County community across every piece of our geography, across every background, and work to integrate those needs into a policy-making framework that's going to work to our mutual benefit. And so, of course, that means doing lots of listening and lots of outreach and lots of engagement. And I've done that and will continue to seek to do that as your mayor. And then taking all of that formal outreach that you do through electronic mechanisms and in-person gatherings and gathering with the athens Clark County Commission, the policymaking body, to translate the needs of the community into tangible action, to figure out how do we put policies in place that are going to be supportive of the population in, in a permanent way, around housing, around health care, around youth needs, around access to public resources, and then putting the budget together together so that we actually have the direction of the funds and the staffing to make those things happen. So it really is working from concept, where you draw from the full community, to execution, where you're seeing tangible things happening on the ground for the community's needs. So making that translation, I, I see, is the key role of the, the mayor of athens Clark County. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Ms. Ross. Yes, um, just not to say things on what Kelly just said. What Kelly just explained it perfectly. <laughs> and that's what I do every day. So um, I'm laughing because that's my everyday role in this community. So as mayor, it would come. I say you, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So with all of those things, as a mayor, you have to implement those. When it comes to addressing the community, my first thing will do will be to clean up the leadership. Do we have true, real leadership here in Athens? I don't think we do. I think in leadership, you have to have that experience. You have to see people for who they are. That's in all demographics. But with that being said, you got to go out and implement an action plan. So what is our sustainability plan? What is... Um, the things that we want to actually do for the homeless to help them get to another place. So as mayor, my first role would be to clean up the leadership as well as go over the budget and implement a community feedback coalition that will consist of a committee of people who are able to come to meetings that they're aware of, not 44 hours, 48 hours in advance, but to be able to address their real concerns and implement that stuff so that we can actually get some things done. So as mayor, I would I would say that my proposal will be to actually implement the community feedback and not just listen, but take action. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Coleman, what do you see as your primary role as mayor? I see it as my primary role as the mayor to serve and to protect the city of Athens. My main focus for running for mayor is to help my people. We have belittled ourselves so much that we don't care anymore. It's time to flip the switch in Clark County. It's time for all the black people, young and old, to unite with unity, to get an education, to have a family, to love one, to grow wealth, to be happy, to marry, to love, just to be alive. So my main focus here in Clark County as mayor is first to hit the low income area, to show them how possible it will be for you to be a somebody. It's very important. The last pandemic we had, which is called the COVID-19 pandemic, has divided the black family. They have pitted husband against wife, girlfriend against boyfriend, sisters against sisters, brothers against brothers, white against white, black against black. If I had had that position as the male at the time when the first pandemic came out, 
How would they acknowledge the situation? Since we don't know anything about as much as the scientists claim to know, I would advise people wear your mask if you feel unsafe. For those who don't feel they need to wear a mask, that's their will, that's their right, that's their liberty, that's their hope. See, this government in Athens called County, we speak in two different languages. We speak in the language of the black man, we speak in the language of the white man. And we cannot communicate because one want to be over, over the other, want to have power over the other. But I'm here to join us all together as one. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Okay, just so everyone knows, we will be taking questions from the audience up until 145. 145, right? 145. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, we hope to be able to ask three full questions at the end of this. So that's why we're trying to keep uh, our timing so, so tight. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, then please raise your hand and someone will bring you a, an index card and then we will sort those out and we will start asking questions at 2 o'clock. Yes, sir? Raise your, hand. raise your hand. Yes, sir. You're luckily you're right next to the intern that can help you. Okay. Um, Cassidy, raise your hand, Cassidy. Cassidy is an Athens anti discrimination movement intern, intern, and she is here to uh, bring you a card and a pen if you have, if you would like to ask a question. Okay, we're going to move on to question number two. And. What would your budget priorities be for the athens Clark County government, and why? And Mr. Gertz, we'll go to you first. Uh, thanks for the question, and it's uh, timely as I'm in the midst of preparing the budget for the fiscal year 23 as we speak. Um, and really, as I look to not only this budget, but the coming years, you know, I think about a long arc of activity where we're creating the kind of firmament for athens Clark County that's going to allow us to be successful now and successful well into the future. And so that means that um, what I've programmed into this budget and certainly with some of our uh, federal funds is a lot of youth support because we know that if we're supporting young people, we're going to support a healthy future. Um, we've programmed in this budget through our SPLOS program and other means an enormous amount of energy transition because we want to make sure that Athens is a community that's resilient and that's able to move sort of past a carbon, uh, carbon energy dynamic. We've programmed a lot of funds for making sure that our streets are safer. You know, we know an enormous challenge over the course of the last couple of years has been an increase in vehicular accidents and vehicular deaths. And so we want to make sure that we bend the curve on that. And we similarly want to make sure that people can access all the things they need to in the community, employment, school, leisure, in other ways other than just having a vehicle. So we're programming more funds into bike and pedestrian facilities and public transit. And we're also looking at a whole continuum of life need. And so that includes support for seniors. We've recently become a, an American Association of Retired Persons city. And so we want to make sure that this is a place where you can gracefully age in place. And we also are looking at those members of our community who may be returning citizens, who may have been formerly incarcerated, so that we can bend the curve on recidivism and make sure that people have opportunities here. So we're putting resources into that as well. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. The next, next we'll have uh, Ms. Makisha Ross, followed by Mr. Coleman, and then Ms. Ms. Hall. Ms. Ross, again, the question is, what will your budget priorities be as mayor and why? So first, my budget priorities, it will actually cause a review. Um, after reviewing the budget, I would honestly change um, the staff who can distribute the budget, which I would change the staff for the city manager. I would propose to be able to, you know, get that position filled with someone that has a vision I don't, I'm not, in my opinion, just, I don't know, he had the vision that the community wants. So having someone that actually has that vision for the community 
that's how you know where to distribute the money to. So I would actually go into the awareness and resource hub that I would like to create for people to always know what's available to them. Because right now they don't. We have several resources and several jobs, but I don't think our government do a good job at letting people know what's available. So I would implement that and raise the salaries of teachers. And the reason I say that, you got to want to be able to raise the salaries of teachers so they can deal with the issues that's happening in the school and they can want to actually go to work. But then actually making a sustainable development affordable housing plan that is actually affordable. So that's what I would do with the budget. But the main concern is for me to remove the people that is in control of the budget and making sure that they see the vision for the community. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Coleman? What will your budget priorities be as mayor and why? Oh, it's red. Okay. Can we uh, use that mic? Yeah. Thanks. My budget priority as mayor of Clark County is to make sure the money is here. To run the city. Just put it a little closer. So just put it a little closer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My, uh, my main budget priority is to run Clark County, is to make sure the money is here in Clark County, that all the taxes are paid, all the fines and fees are paid. Make sure all the roads are in drivable conditions. Make sure families be able to live a lovely life in Clark County. But let's be for real. I'm not script for this type of gathering. I have to come straight from my heart. I can promise you a lot of things, but action counts louder than words. And I will make sure that each and every one of you has an opportunity to call me up. And please don't get on the internet. I refuse to deal with the emails. Call me up, write me a letter, whatever, so I have person to person contact. And we, as a citizen of Clark County, we will make sure the budget project is in line. I'm green, so you have an opportunity to mold me in a good way. To understand that, you have that opportunity to mold me in a good way. That's, my, that's why my budget problem is, is going to be to make sure the money is here to run Clark County. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Ms. Hall, is there somebody you could see uh, if the library personnel can give us another microphone? Thank you. Ms. Hall, yes ma'am, what will your budget priorities be as mayor and why? My budget priority for the city of Athens as mayor would be to make sure that all the citizens are able to obtain the things that they need. I have gone through the budget for the 2022 20, year that I have seen the commissioner put together. And there are some things that I would like to put top priority as to what I have seen. More for our seniors, I should see an area where we can say this money has been set aside for our seniors. I understand, and for, you know, fixing the street, the trees and the highways and all those things, but let's do something for the people in Clark County. Let's put set aside a budget that would help those that rent is due that can't be paid. Let's set aside a budget for those that need food. We all help in every kind of way. But I think there should be a budget set aside for the less fortune, for the senior, for the housing. If there is a person that's low in rent and can't pay it, there should be a budget set up somewhere, not to be misused, but to say, hey, let's pay for their rent for this month. This is our town. We are the peoples of this town. And we need to take care of the people of this town. So that would be my top priority, is to do what the mayor should do. No disrespect to you as to take care of the people in Clark County. 
in whatever way we can. Thank you, Ms. Hall. We're going to move on to our next question. And the order for this round will be Ms. Mykeisha Ross will go first, Ms. Hall, you will be second, Ms. Penny Coleman, third, and Mr. Gertz, you will go last. The question is for Ms. Ross. What is your plan to address the affordable housing crisis in Athens? Well, uh, honestly, my plan will be, I like to use models, and I like to go to other areas that have the same population that Clark County has, and what's working and what's not working. So I travel to um, a couple places and see how they are actually answering affordable housing by connecting it to the resources and having youth organizations and nonprofit organizations available to them with the elders and the seniors attached to them. I would like to address affordable housing that way and as well as with a sustainable development goal, how can we do that? You, you come up with a strategic planning of what is it that the people want to see. Because sometimes we're we're making these promises and not taking the action. But also, is that really what the people want? What's the people wanting for the well-being of themselves, the basic service needs? That's also how you can address affordable housing and the people that's living in them. But with that being said, affordable housing is not here in Athens. $1,400 a bed is not affordable housing. UGA property is not affordable housing. So making sure that the, the heir of the people that has inherited land get their land, making sure that the people who can be able to stay with the job, because we're underpaid, overworked, and underemployed, so how can we be able to live as people? And I just, I want to leave with you to make sure that we're using models that work. What can address these? Because some of the arts and the, the people that apply rental assistance and wraparound service, they're not really addressing our issues. I've been in that position of poverty and been poor before, and I was able to work my way out with a formula to address the affordable housing. And so what I would do will build something that is really affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Before we go on to the uh, next person, uh, Ms. Hall, for your answer, uh, if you have a question, now is uh, you only have a few more minutes to uh, fill out an index card. So if you have a question or if you'd like to turn in a card, now is the time to do it. Please raise your hand if you if you need some help. Cassidy, um, there's a gentleman right down front. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. The question is, what is your plan to address the affordable housing crisis in Athens? Ms. Hall. What shall I do about the housing? You know, it's, that's a hard question for me because I don't know what is considered affordable housing. It, you can live in a place a teacher can make a great salary, but she still can't afford a wonderful house. So what do we consider affordable houses? That's a good question I think we all need to think about. What is affordable house? Where you live is affordable if you're able to pay for it. Now there are some people who are living and they are struggling every day. And with Athens, we're a place where we take so much pride in what we are there's so much shortage on houses. So you're asking me about affordable houses. I'm going to be honest. Once I find out the true meaning of affordable housing, I will be able to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Next, Mr. Benny Coleman, what is your plan to address the affordable housing crisis in Athens? Well, I've been working with... Uh, I've been working with Flamingo Mobile Home, which is called Manufactured Home, for 10 years. We had came up with an idea of having a community of manufactured homes, at least 100 units in that community. See, manufactured homes are safe and affordable. The minimum or maximum amount of 
monthly rent will be $500 or below. That would be the excellent choice for something quick. Nothing that you can sit around and debate over for years and years and then come up and say that. No affordable homes. We need something right now at this moment. We need something on the ground going at this moment. Affordable housing is an opportunity for the new contractors that are coming out today. But greed has overtaken all the contractors in Clark County and the city and, and, and the whole world. Material aren't as high as they seem to be. It's just the, the labor and the owner of the contractor company are making this so high. So affordable housing, just like Pearl said, what exactly is affordable housing? It's what an individual can afford to pay at he or she level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Mr. Gertz, what is your plan to address the affordable housing crisis in Athens? So we know that in Athens, like in every attractive magnetic community in the country, there's an affordable housing crisis. And that crisis has really multiple layers. That there's simply the affordability element of it, but then broadly there's also the availability element of it. It's the volume of housing relative to the population. So we, we got census data in the autumn, and if you look at the last 20 years, us and contiguous counties have grown from about 255,000 people to about 380,000 people. And the housing stock has not grown at nearly the same rate. And so part of what we need to do is simply get more units on the ground. Uh, as any of the kids who went through my economics class in the seven years when I taught that would tell you, you know, part of this is a supply and demand question. And so I'm really proud of an enormous number of things that we've launched here in athens Clark County. Uh, some of my commission colleagues are here in the audience who've been a big part of this. Just a week ago, we launched an inclusionary zoning policy which is gonna incentivize people who own old strip malls and parking lots to redevelop that, redevelop that property into housing, you know, from places where they never had housing in the first place. And some of that will have to be permanently affordable housing. And so as we see the volume rise, some of that volume is gonna be affordable. We also have launched the SPLOST program that had the highest proportion devoted to affordable housing of any community in the state. So I'm really proud of that work. And finally, we've devoted $11 million of our American Rescue Plan Act funds to housing, more than any of our other peer communities in the state. You saw a lot of communities devote those ARPA funds to garbage trucks or short-term programs, but we're devoting that to housing, and that's gonna include the rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing that our unsheltered persons need. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Okay, we're going to move to our fourth question. This will be our final prepared question. And then we'll take questions from the audience, or we will take those cards. The order for this answer, uh, this round will be Mr. Coleman, you'll go first. Ms. Ross, you will be second. Mr. Gertz, third. And then Ms. Hall. The question is, Regarding the recently established Public Safety Civilian Oversight Board, what steps do you plan to take to expedite implementation of the board, especially in light of the athens Clark County Jail safety concerns and the complaints of staff and inmates that were submitted to AADM? Mr. Coleman. Well, this is a very hard question because Clark County have rewarded bad behavior. So how, how I would implement the board and gearing toward the safety of the Athens Clark County Jail is, we may have to let the little people that are working there come up with ideas over the ones who are making the big money. I know drugs have been held up in our jail homes, all the nine crimes going inside the jail house. But being a black man, living in a neighborhood like Clark County, we got to be acceptable for our crimes. We got to be, uh, be, a, be accountable in many ways. Mothers got to stop 
allowing their kids to cause trouble. Fathers got to step up to keep their kids from going to jail. The whole black neighborhood needs to unite together. And then we will eliminate a lot of this crime that's going on in Clark County. I know black men are the only one committing crimes, but we are, we are the only one who can listed in the paper are committing these crimes. We stand before the board a commission. We plead for help, and it takes police a long time to get in our communities. We need to patrol our own community. We need to police our own community. And then this crime will slow down in the black neighborhood. I'm not a radical person. I'm just speaking what's really going on. What you all are always thinking, what you all are always seeing is what's coming from my mouth. But you're afraid to say something because of your status. You're afraid to make us angry because you may be a different race. But communication among us, that's very important. And that is the main reason why crime is so harsh today. Kids are not being kids in school. Mothers are being children, and children are being mothers. We need to be a family. We need to bring the Lord back into our life. Okay. Mr. Cole? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. And next, Ms. Ross. <clears throat> okay. Um, so when addressing the Public Safety Oversight Board, um, I was actually a part of that process, um, me and Ashley Mary Bruce. And when coming up with those ideas, it, it was from the feedback that we were receiving from the community. But how do you address uh, public safety when people can't sit together? Communication, partnership, collaboration. But how I would address it is, for one, we need more resource officers. What are resource officers? They apply the necessary awareness resources that, that they can give to the families, not just calling the 911, but mental health. We need a lot of mental health answers instead of police. Um, answering those calls. So with that being said, we need to have a hotline or a hub inside the police department so that we can address those 911 calls that's not emergency. I think my mind is still um, But the leadership is one thing. The other thing is mandatory meetings. We need to have all law enforcement sit down and have a conversation with our local government. The other thing is, if you don't know, the police staff is short, the sheriff is short, a lot, it's, it's shortage, it's staff shortage. We have to get people recruited to actually want to be officers. So how do we do that? You might want to raise their pay. So with that being said, we got to come up with those ideas that can help people answer our questions. And that might be increasing pay. If you don't know, a lot of people know their work now, so they're not going to go to work for nothing. So that's how I would address the oversight police, is implementing mental health and having mandatory meetings with all local law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Gertz? So I'm, I'm proud of having been, both as a county commissioner and now as mayor, an advocate for Public Safety Oversight Board. Um, it's important that the community and our law enforcement officers be able to engage with each other and grow in mutual understanding. That, that really is the, the reason that, that I was an advocate for that board and continue to be. And so what I've done is engaged with the public safety units so that those members can be onboarded and oriented and also engaged with the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement so they can continue to be an outside resource so they don't just have experts from within Clark County, but they have national experts as well at their disposal. What I would certainly say to the Public Safety Oversight Board and would want everybody in this room to know is that the Department of Justice has a very important office about investigation of those people who are in incarceration. And you may know that, in fact, that Department of Justice outfit currently is investigating the Georgia Department of Corrections for some of the failures in that series of venues. What I also uh, would note is that what we can do best as an entire community, if we want to benefit not only people who are incarcerated temporarily in our jail, but also the employees there, is really see reduction in violence community-wide. 
We've benefited from a 25-year arc of reduced crime in athens Clark County, but we know it's not at zero. Every aggravated assault and every one of the four murders we had last year was one incident too many. And so we need to resource our community in a way that we are going to reduce violence. Because when we have less violence, we're going to have less incarceration, and we're going to benefit all of us. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Ms. Hall. I was honored to sit at the Ebenezer Baptist Church West, where our pastor had called a meeting with the chief of police and all the officers. And thank you, Gertz. And what he had to tell us was very important. Shortage of help, inmates being released before their time is finished. What do we do? We sit down and we discuss issues about what's going on in the jail. There's fighting going on in the jail. But if you, he say, I quote, if you jump into it, you may be hurt or you can be sued. So what can they do? So I told him maybe they need to come up with a plan where they can meet with all the polices. That includes the sheriff or any law enforcement. And let's get with them and come up with a plan as to how we can keep these inmates in jail as well as keep them safe and keep our officers safe. Our officers are very important. We need to respect our police officers and we need to do whatever we can to help them as well as those inmates that are in the prison system. So this is what we'll do. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Okay, that is the end of our prepared questions. We have four questions that we will try and get to. Uh, and we'll just go ahead and dive right in. The first question, and the order for this, for the responses, will be Mr. Coleman, Ms. Ross, Mr. Gertz, Ms. Hall. The question is, give us an example of how you solved a community problem, include the steps that you took and your thought process. I'll read it again. Give, me, give us an example of how you solve the community problem. Give us your steps and thought process. Mr. Coleman. Uh, so how I, how I solved the community problem was, that was an incident when there was a married couple having a fight. I had the, the choice of intervening or the just forget about it. But I choose to calm them down. I calm them down by realizing and letting them know that each one of you are somebody. That you all need to stop doing what you're doing. And by coming with that decision, a lot uh, the, the action that came from this couple was they realized anger is just a sharp fuse. It only lasts as long as the wick burns. If I keep adding to that feud, the anger will continue to get longer and longer. So they realized that they had to stop. And they appreciated me talking to them because they said the police didn't have to get involved. My mother didn't have to get involved. My father didn't have to get involved. My sister didn't have to get involved. My brother didn't have to get involved. You was a stranger, didn't have anything to do with this situation, but yet you took the time to communicate with us, to tell us, and talk to us. And that's how I saw the problem. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Okay, Ms. Ross? Um, a problem that I see every day in the community is uh, youth development, the crisis of the youth, as well as homelessness. So what did I do? I started Youth This Life. And with that, it started in my closet at my home. Um, giving clothes, donating clothes to the ones who had lack of clothes. We also have a program with uh, addressing the homelessness and feeding them. So I have a distribution center, a free distribution center where people can come and shop. 
for free and get their clothes, their household items, as well as partnering with um, different local grassroots organizations who are actually on the ground doing the work um, that don't get recognized. But yeah, we address a lot of lack of food insecurities within the homeless population each and every day. So not just one meal a day, we give them breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as well as food and each and every day. That's what me and my kids do. We supply community service. Um, I went in Stonehenge. I cleaned up the recreation center so that the kids can have somewhere to play. I also proposed on the t Supplies Committee that presentation to be able to add sidewalks so the workers can get to and from work and the kids can get to the basketball court to play. Now I'm just looking for a playground. So that's how I address issues in the community. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Gertz? Uh, so I, I, I could select a number of examples, but um, I think where we're sitting right now is, is the perfect place to start. And it was brought to my attention around five years ago that the library here needed extra security in the afternoons. Um, dug in a little bit and found out, well, the, the kind of need for security was born from the number of middle school students who were coming over in an unstructured way after school in the afternoon and just hanging out, but not in any way that was focused. So realizing that, well, we could put some more money into security, but maybe we could do something that was more fundamental and deeper as a solution. I brought together Clark County School District personnel, Athens Clark County folks, people from the Office of Service Learning on the University of Georgia's campus, and library employees and management. And what we determined is that really we just had the case of a lot of young people who were looking for an outlet, looking for an opportunity in the afternoon. And so together, what we were able to build is the direction of a VISTA post-undergraduate um, staff member from the Office of Service Learning who was assigned to the library. And that VISTA worker created partnerships with community organizations around chess, around sewing, around music production, around literacy, and many other places. And so you had a lot of young people who now had productive activities to do here in the afternoon and things that were going to enrich their lives and we were going to actually diminish the need for security as a result. So it was a creative solution and it was one that involved a lot of community stakeholders, which is the way that I think we best build opportunity here in, in the community. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Ms. Hall, give us an example of how you solve the community problem. Include your steps and your thought process. How I do this is my house is open to parents. I have many parents that call me that's having an issue with their teenagers. And I say, bring them to me. And they come to my house for the weekend. And I ask, what's the problem? Many children come. They sit there. They bless their mothers out and father. But I find a solution for the answer. I say, now it's time for you to sit here, think about what you said to your mother, and you all will be surprised at the number of people that has my number that call me of both race. I let them into my home. I'm not afraid of them because I know somebody got to love them. And I know their parents love them, but they've been out all night, half of the night. They don't know where to go. They said, well, we're going to call Miss Hall. And this came up from a lady that I know very well who used to have children from defects. They call her at night. She joined me in with the program. And those are my steps to helping parents. I would take your child. I would bring them into my house. I would feed them, and I would give them back to you. Those are my steps I have. That's the love I have for people. That's the love I have for children. So everybody don't do that, but I would do it. So if you have a child that's unruly, I see about them, and those are my steps, and I'm not afraid. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Okay, the next question that we have from the audience, what are your thoughts on working with the Clark County School District to address issues of inequity and segregation 
of children within our K through 12 schools. Again, what are your thoughts on working with Clark County School, the Clark County School District towards addressing inequity and segregation of children within our K through 12 schools? And this order will be Mr. Gertz, Ms. Ross, Mr. Coleman, and Ms. Hall. So there was a, a, a great, but I, I will say pretty lengthy and dense report um, that if you've got maybe a few hours of your time, you might want to look at, came out about five years ago. It was called the Iceberg Principle, and it was put together by the National Superintendents Roundtable. And what an international bit of research found is that when you look at outcomes of school-aged children, a bit of those outcomes are born from what happens in the brick and mortar buildings of schools. But a lot of that, those outcomes come from what happens in neighborhoods and communities. But about a third of outcomes are born based on, is this a healthy neighborhood to live in? Do these kids have access to fun places to go, to good things to do? And so for us as the unified government, an enormous thing that we can do is simply make for safer neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are better resourced where there are food resources accessible, where there are parks accessible, where there are trails accessible. And I think we should also take a step further and work directly with the Clark County School District, which I'm in the midst of doing right now. I've met about half a dozen times with the superintendent and one of the assistant superintendents. And what I've recommended is that we put together an ongoing three-way partnership between the Clark County School District, the athens Clark County Unified Government, and the great array of community-based nonprofits that are doing youth services work. Because we all care about the same kids, we want to see the same positive outcomes, and we should develop both an uh, information exchange platform and a funding scheme that allows us all to have mutual benefit for the young people in our community. Um, I have every bit of confidence that that's going to come to fruition this year, at least in part with some of the American Rescue Plan Act dollars we've got, but I think it's going to be a foundation that will be uh, able to be utilized for decades to come. So I'm very excited about that. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Ms. Ross. <clears throat> um, Thank you for borrowing my ideas. <laughs> Anytime. Good, good things have no ownership. <laughs> I appreciate what he just said, what I wrote. Um, so that's what I would do. Um, so yeah, um, that's exactly what I would do because there is a model, you know, that if you collaborate and partner with the Clark County School District, that you can have more community engagement. You can have those organizations come in because the community is relatable. Some of these kids that's hurting, they, they're not relating to their teachers. So with that being said, you gotta bring people from the outside that these teachers have our kids for probably eight hours, nine hours a day, and that's their release. But then when they go back home to that environment, you don't know what they're going through. So even through the COVID, where I was out here and being able to give the packets and food and clothes for some of those kids, their parents didn't know how to do the work. Their parents didn't know virtual learning. They might not have internet. They, and so addressing those issues and making sure that we're not just sitting back judging these people. We're actually trying to find, I don't want to say trying, but we are finding a solution to their problem. So with that being said, and with Kelly sharing out my idea, I really do think we need to partner. And, and if, you know, any one of us could really take that idea, because the youth is very dear and passionate to my heart. I have my own two over here. And it, it's a lot going on in the school district that we need to address, but that's how we end the school to prison pipeline. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Coleman? Well, what I would totally do overhaul the whole school system. If it's possible, find them all. <laughs> Get rid of them all. I mean, we're at the bottom of the list for how many years? It, it doesn't make any sense to live in a universal system area to be at almost at the bottom of the list in the school system? Come on, people. Something is wrong here. Is it the kids or is it the parents? What is the problem? 
So I guess you ask me what is the problem. The problem is parents need to be parents. Kids need to be kids. Teachers need to be teachers, not love, not babysitters, not doctors, not lawyers, not chiropractors, none of that. They need to teach the school system. So in order to have the correct school system, I think everybody who needs that school system needs to be voted in by the public. Don't let anyone in the school system elect someone as a superintendent, the head teacher, teacher of the year. Let the people do it because the people are the ones who are suffering. Understand, the people are the ones who are suffering in the school system. Not the teachers. Teachers are making their money. They go home every day collecting their dues. And the kids are coming home to what? Desolation. Horror. Fear. Uncertainty. Cannot even read. Cannot even count. Fussing and fighting. So we need to overhaul the whole school system in Acton Clark County. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Ms. Hall. As a retired Clark County school employee, I always have to commend the teachers, the employees, and everyone on the job well done. What they try to do and work with what they have to work with. We have to be honest about this thing. There are so many things the school system needs. They need more computers. They need more laptop. I think they need to bring their parents in for a great big training. When we are off school and the kids don't have anyone to help them with math, science, and social study, we can't blame the parents because they don't know. Because there are a lot of us in here that are grandparents that we don't know. So there should be a setup somewhere in the system where we can have parents with children to come in and show them how to work with the children and not be embarrassed about it. So I think if we can get more technology for the parents, and get things brought in for the student to be able to carry out their duties and responsibility and control the behavior, which is unbearably in the school system. And I can tell you that. <clears throat> and there's so much that they can do. The fighting is terrible. And I'm here to tell you, because I watched it. I looked at it. I broke them up. The fighting is terrible. And when you bring the parents in to say, hey, your child has done so and so, then you got to deal with the parents. So we have a problem with parents and students in the system. So we need to work out a plan that we can work with the parents and the students. That's my theory on how we can deal with the Clark County School District as a retired employee. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Okay. Our next question. Please give us examples of situations where you have proven your ability to work with people who do not look like you or think like you, specifically in regards to race, economic issues, or any area that you would like to comment on. The order for this Round will be Mr. Coleman, Ms. Hall, Mr. Gertz, and Ms. Ross. Please give us examples of situations where you have proven your ability to work with people who do not look like you or think like you, specifically in regards to race, economic issues, or any area you would like to comment. Mr. Coleman. Well, I'm a former employee of the University of North Georgia. I was real here in Clark County, and I was taught by my grandmother. She said, respect women. That's the last thing you do, respect a woman. But do not let a woman beat you down. <laughs> I used to work at, as a janitor there at the school at the University of North Georgia. I would open the doors for the young ladies. You know what remark I would get? You don't have to open the door for me. I have to open my own door. 
That's the problem we have here today. We don't want to understand and realize a woman is a woman, a man is a man. There are responsibilities for each and every one of us. And what I would do, and what I have done, when I came upon a racial problem, the best thing you can do is laugh it off. Because if you get too deeply involved into that problem, you're going to become part of that problem. You have to be the narrator, which I was plenty of times. I've been called all kinds of names. I've been spit on, cussed at, attacked. Even clans came after me. Yes, here in Clark County. Yes. But the reward that came from that, a large percentage of those people came back to me and said, thank you, Mr. Coleman, for understanding what was going on. Understanding, that's key. We got to understand one another out here in this world and in the public. To unite our love toward one another. And the best thing and the best advice I can give anybody, regardless of your race, believe in yourself. Believe that you are somebody. Believe that you can make a difference. And believe that you have the right and liberty for the pursuit of happiness and joy in this country. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Ms. Hall, please give us examples of situations where you have proven your ability to work with people who do not look like you or think like you, specifically in regards to race or economic issues or any area that you would like to comment on. That is very easy. Come to my family reunion. We have all multicolors, and we work together. Our family consists of black, white, Hispanic, so our children are able to play with each other and understand each other. And we teach them that this is your family. You can choose everything in life, but you can't choose your family. So we try to love each other and respect each other. So that's how we carry out our way of diversity. That is the way we learn to love one another, regardless of race, creed, or color. Because when you're sitting at your table for the family reunion, you're looking in one of those faces. So what can you say? Nothing but I love you. So that is the way I handle situations when it comes to race, creed, or color. I always look back at my family. So if you don't have any yours, Keep living. They're coming. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hall. Mr. Curtis, please give us examples of situations where you have proven your ability to work with people who do not look like you or think like you, specifically in terms of race, economic issues, or anything you'd like to comment on. So broadly, I find one of the most important things I do, direct engagement and outreach with this entire community, I, I probably get the most um, fulfilling experience in, in that realm just by being on the streets, on my feet, talking to people that I encounter um, in any place in the community. You know, we've come through this really difficult couple of years where engagement has not looked like I think all of us grew up expecting engagement to look and people have seemed distant. And, you know, I, I take it as a sort of solemn oath of this role that I've got to work overtime now to continue to engage. And that means meeting people where they are. And certainly in the life that I've lived in Athens, that I've been lucky to live in Athens, you know, maybe the hallmark was the time that I worked for the Clark County School District and was doing homebound care. And so that meant that I had to go out to young people's homes if they were on long-term disability and sit with them multiple times a week to make sure that they understood their lessons. And oftentimes, th those young people and their families didn't look like me, didn't have backgrounds like I did. So I think about Myra, and I sat in her trailer with her mom, Teresa, and her week in, week out. You know, African-American family, you know, talking to a guy who had a master's degree, being willing to have honest conversations, and, and the necessity for me being willing to understand what their lives were like with no preconception. 
but just understanding and taking in their experience. So anyhow, to them and all those young folks and their families who I was able to, to share time with, I mean, that, that has been a blessing in my life. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Ms. Ross, please give us examples of situations where you have proven your ability to work with people who do not look like you or think like you, specifically in regards to race, economic issues, or any, any area that you would desire to comment on. Uh, my everyday um, personal mission statement is to be the light in the darkness, no matter where you stand. And my everyday job is community outreach specialist. That's what everything I do, no matter where I go, I am in a room of diversity. If, if I might be the only African American woman in the room, and with being that only person, it it gets to be you adapt to it and you get flexibility from it. So it's not so much as racism to me anymore or who likes you or what their opinion of you are. You have to be able to sacrifice yourself sometimes. If you're trying to take a stand and make a difference in life, you got to be willing to sit at those tables. And that's what some of the lack of leadership comes from because people are afraid to sit at those tables. And I do that every single day. So I'm on different committees, different boards, and my everyday job is community outreach, which is going into every area of this community and being able to be relatable with these individuals. So it's an everyday job for them. So that's the easy question. Thank you, Ms. Ross. At this time, that ends all of the questions that we had for from the that ends all of the questions that we will have time for. Um, we would like to, on behalf of the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, I would like to thank you all for showing up today to become a part of the solution and for staying engaged in this community. It has never been more important. And so to see the beautiful diversity that Athens, Georgia has brought out is just really fantastic. Uh, at this time, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. AADM was created in 2016 by Mocha Jasmine Johnson and her husband, Noah Johnson. They launched it in an effort to combat repeated allegations of discrimination by bars and business owners in downtown Athens. Since that time, they have worked tirelessly to build an effective movement. The Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement advocates for racial and social justice and strives to combat discrimination through education and activism. AADM offers various workshops, programs, and resources designed to help citizens protect their civil and human rights. They have three programs. The Freedom Fund, which addresses uh, issues of <clears throat> police brutality. The Teen Social Justice Program, which is designed to cultivate future leaders, build self-confidence, and teach students how to respectfully use their voice to advocate for their rights. The Education and Tra Training for Change. This program is designed to train community members to advocate for themselves, gain more in-depth knowledge about the criminal justice institution, improve race relations, and develop activist skills. They also have three services. Number one, community service. Whether you need community service for school and independent activity or court order, AADM can help you give back to your community and meet your community service requirements. They have an anti-discrimination advocacy service. Advocates are available to provide support and guidance for people who they feel have been discriminated against by an individual or an institution. They are here for clients as they seek resources and help provide them with a platform for their voice to be heard. And then bail and legal support. We understand at AADM that folks held in jail are innocent until proven otherwise. Racial, economic, and social inequalities create a system where more black and brown folks are forced into jails and given higher bonds. These same inequalities create burdens for marginalized communities, often making it difficult or outright impossible to pay the bond and leave the terrible conditions of jail. AADM is committed to helping pay jail, bail for those in need, and to help reunite families and loved ones. If you or loved one need support, the number to contact AADM is 800-922-3607.
You can also volunteer with the AADM movement by emailing admin at AADM, AADM movement.org. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Without any, oh, I'm sorry. Let, let us just uh, say one, if we could get a round of applause for all of our candidates.